Thanks so much, Reverend Edwards, for for stepping in for Reverend McKinstry, who is enjoying his grandson's football game tonight. We're excited about that. And thank you for holding it and praying a little extra long for me. I got stuck at the um, stoplight over here. I was getting my hair cut, Deacon Thomas, and uh, it doesn't take very long. <laughs> but it took me a little longer to get from the, uh, when the, the train came. But I'm glad to be here. I just thank God for each of you uh, tonight. And I pray that you had a great day and, and, and the day. And, uh, and I pray that tonight the word of God would just strengthen us and give us even more joy. I think the thing that I've learned most about since we've been living in expectation 909 days uh, is that the joy, and I remember the book of Nehemiah <clears throat> where uh, as they had built the, rebuilt the walls, they said the joy of the Lord is our strength. And I thought about it and over, the, over, over the years, not just today, but over the years, what does that mean? What is the joy of the Lord? <clears throat> and the people of um, Nehemiah's time, the ones that come back from Babylonian captivity, first of all, rejoiced because they were out of captivity. Uh, second of all, they rejoiced because they saw the hand of God moving on their behalf. If you remember in the very beginning, the walls were decimated. They were decimated. They were broken down, burned, torn down. But they saw the hand of God in providing them for the material to build a wall, giving them the strength to build a wall, and then giving them the strength against those enemies that fought against them. You remember those guys? Uh, San Bal and all those people that sought against them. So in, in recognizing that, they said the joy of the Lord, like the knowledge of the Lord, the knowledge of the Lord, the joy of the Lord, that the not knowing him caused you to have joy. And then being joyful in the fact that you know the Lord gives you strength. And that's what I think the word of God has done for us. I know it's done it for me. The more I read the word of God, I've been reading the word of God. We've been reading the word of God a long time. There's something about reading it every day. It's like a wave. Every day you kind of, it continues to hit you and lift you up, push you a little higher. And so that's what the joy of the Lord, uh, the word of the Lord has done. Give us more knowledge about who God is. As we've looked at the book of Romans, I believe that we've learned more and more and more and more and more about who God is to us, who he is. He's our sovereign God. But we've learned that his love for us was so much he gave us a saving Jesus. We learned so much that despite the fact that we stood guilty before God, no matter what our backgrounds were, that God gave us uh, through our belief in Jesus and belief that he raised Jesus from the dead, belief in him, that God said, because you believe in me and because you believe in my son Jesus, I'm declaring you righteous. What a powerful thing that God has done for us. What a mighty blessing. It's just out of his abundance of love that all he was required of us to believe in him and he pours out on us justification. We've learned that. And that cause, should cause us to have joy, that there's no more work for us to do, that the work has been done by Jesus on the cross. There's no more explaining to do. God has declared us righteous. And so in keeping that in mind, every day of our lives, there ought to be some joy in there. And that ought to make us grow stronger with the knowledge of just how much God loves us. Last night, we stopped at chapter 5, verse 1. And I want to keep going, but see, if I kept going that night, I'd have still been going now. So I paused so I could start back tonight and uh, get us back going here. Uh, we're talking about the benefits of, of, our, of our salvation, the benefits of being justified by God. Um, just for anybody who may have missed last night, I want to, I got to go back and just get, if I can touch on ever so slightly, uh, I got to read this verse again. Beginning at verse 17 through verse 25, Paul outlines a series of facts a series of facts that were related to Abraham's life. But at the same time, as he tells us at the very end, uh, that, that they were, his, his life and his living and his belief in God was an example for us, that we could receive the same thing that Abraham did. Yes, Abraham was declared righteous by God. Yes, God accounted to Abraham because he believed in him and his promises. But it gives us an example of what we need to focus on in our Christian walk. I got to read it, verse, chapter 4, verse 17. He says, as it is written, I have made thee a father. God is saying this to Abraham of many nations. Before him, before God, whom he believed, even God. In other words, Abraham, as Paul outlines it, Abraham was made a father of many nations because he believed God. And then he tells us the attributes of God. God quickened the dead and caused those things which be not as though they were. But it also tells us that Abraham believed those attributes of God. Abraham believed that God brought the dead back to life. He could bring the dead back to life and could call those things which weren't as though they were. He also said that one of the things Abraham did was his hope was so, he had a sold out hope. I'll use that term. He believed despite all facts pointed, it wasn't going to happen. He believed in hope. What was his hope? His hope was the word of God. He believed in hope against the odds. He believed in the promise of the word of God that he would become the father of many nations. According, just because God said it, that he believed it. 
The Bible says in verse 19, what, what, what do I need to have in my life? We need to not have be weak in faith. He said he was not weak in faith. Why? Because of God's promise, he considered that his own body was not dead or neither was Sarah's. He could, he, his, <clears throat> and, and that word consider is kind of a, it's a kind of a accounting term. Like he, he looked at the situation. I'm old, Abraham, Sarah's old. But he looked over here at who made the promise, God. Can God do this? Let me think about it. Yeah, he can. That's what kept him from being weak in faith because he considered it. He thought about it. And sometimes we got to think about a couple of things. First of all, we got to think about what God promises. Then we got to think about what God has already done. It's always amazing. I, and I say this about myself. We look back over our lives and we realize we where we are because God brought us here. How many know that where you are because God brought, brought you here? It wasn't because we were so smart, so slick, so clever, so intelligent. It was because God brought us through. There are a lot of impossibilities we've already faced, but God brought us through. And so understanding that, we need to consider, think about it sometimes. Well, they said this right here. Yeah, they said that back there, but here I am. God is able to do exactly what he said. That's why he was not weak in faith. Then verse 20 said he didn't stagger. Why didn't he stagger the promises of God? Why did he just, why was he so strong in faith? He, in the, in the midst of what he was going through, in the midst of the waiting on the promise, he glorified God. That's a part of the package of the child of God. We should constantly give glory to God. And again, this is different from praise. Giving glory to God is the act to give God credit for the attributes that he is, that he has and that you have seen. If you've seen God as a healer, you can say that. You're a healer. If you understand that he's magnificent, omnipotent, omnipresence, that the time in the life of the believer, we have to say it so that we can then have the expectation to what he has said, what he has, what he has promised he'll make good on. Let me see if I can give one example. And this, I, I know this is always unfair because I make these sports analogies and a lot of you ladies don't watch the sports. But let me give you an example. Um, most of y'all remember when the Falcons lost every year going to Super Bowl. Everybody still, that's still, but those Atlanta Falcons fans, that still hurts. But what happened was many of us would watch the game and we said, well, Tom Brady's quarterback, it ain't over. And then pretty soon we said, they're going to win because Tom Brady's the quarterback. People had a lot of confidence. They, they believed that he was the greatest of all time, the GOAT, all this, that, and the third. And they looked at the game, even though the Falcons were up 27-3, they looked at it like they still going to win. Why? Because Tom Brady was quarterbacking. We should have that and more as it relates to God. God made the whole world out of nothing. And the nothing that was, he made that. He created a world and said that to be like, that was like. Now, here's the thing today. We learn this in Hebrews. God holds everything together by the power of his word. God speaks and it happens. I imagine sometimes that when it's time for the high tide, God said, high tide and high tide to come. Uh, sun up, the sun rises. The other day I woke up. And it was cloudy. And um, I was like, where the sun at? You know, I was looking like I was worried because I thought I overslept and I wasn't sure. And I looked at my phone and it said, well, the sun's supposed to come up at 619. It's 68. What was going on out there? And I'm this true story. I did think that. But now I said, you know what? God got under control. I went back to bed. God controls everything by what? The power of his word. He speaks it and it comes to pass. So understanding that, we should not stagger the promise of God, but we should constantly give glory to God. We should constantly acknowledge him as the only wise and almighty God. He's the only God. And, and because of that, we should just say, I'm trusting him. I'm riding him. I'm believing him. I'm taking him at his word. That's why I believe that Abraham not stagging his faith. The Bible says he was fully persuaded. That means he had no doubt. Somebody say he had no doubt. And sometimes in our lives, we got to have no doubt. We got to have no doubt that God can perform what he promised. Because of that, it was imputed to him for righteousness. And not for him, verse 23 is important, but it was for us as well. And again, it was imputed to him if we believe on him, God, that raised of Jesus, our Lord from the dead, who delivered us from our offenses and was raised again for our justification. Now, the reason why verses 24 and 23 are important, 23 and 24, 24 and 25 are important, is because it speaks directly chapter five. It's always amazing. I can teach the whole class. And if I go back over the same verse, I'll see something. The Lord has shown us. Anybody ever done that? You read the same scripture over and over again. And when you read again, it show you a little something more. So I'm in the Bible shop reading. And I said, wait a minute. I didn't even see this. God's word lives. I want y'all to know that it's a living word. It's not God didn't just write a book and say, well, y'all got to figure it out. He says it still, it lives by the power of the Holy Spirit. So understanding verse 24, that God we, if we believe on him that raised Jesus from our door from the dead, God, and we uh, and, and understand that Jesus, our Lord, was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification, that closes the case. The case is closed. Our justification is secure. Why? Because Jesus died. 
for our offenses was raised again for our justification. So all that Paul has said from the second half of chapter three, beginning at verse 21, all the way to chapter, verse, chapter four, verse 25, he said, I made my case. We are justified by believing in God. We're declared righteous because of the work of Jesus and by believing in God. Now, in chapter five, he says, now, since the case is closed, y'all are convinced now. I can't possibly say, y'all know it now. Justification is the only way to salvation. And you are justified by believing God. Because of that, verse, five, verse one, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Again, we have peace. I don't know if anybody ever had anybody owe them some money. But if somebody owe you some money, don't you kind of feel a certain way when you see them? Anybody had that happen? Now don't, don't raise your hands because I know. What, 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 but, if, but if somebody owes some money, you'd be like, I wish they'd give me my money back. Why do they act like that? The, the price of our sins was paid by Jesus. The debt was satisfied. The debt was satisfied. And as a result, God was no longer mad at us because of our sins. He called, And here's the truth. The, 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 pr the prayer I pray and be praying and the sermons I preach to the unsaved, even the lessons I teach, the words we say ought to be wrought full of the fact that in Christ, we're that's where our salvation comes from, through the work of Christ, by the love of God in giving us a savior. And so we must tell the unbeliever, listen, God is mad at you right now. Somebody said, don't, don't scare them. No, they need to know. If somebody was driving, you were in the car riding out with somebody and the police was chasing you, when you tell them to stop, because ain't no sense in running, because you're going to get caught at some point anyway. Isn't that right? When the sinner is, is going to have to get caught. going to have to pay the price. But it's better to be saved in Christ than to be running and think you're getting away because you're not going to get away. Why? Because we talked about this in verse 3. The day of wrath is coming. The day of God's anger is coming. And as long as we're not in a relationship with God through Jesus Christ, God's wrath will be poured out on us. But all we got to do is believe in God, and God declares peace with us. I'm, woo, mm. Just believe. And God says, the battle is over. He turns his lights off and we are de delivered into his presence. We have peace with God as a result of being justified by faith. That's A. That's just one. I said I was going to try to get some more tonight. Didn't let, me see, let me see if I got any more time left. Okay, I got a little time left. Verse 2. He says, in addition to that, we also have access by faith unto the grace, the unmerited favor of God, where we stand and then are able to rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. So let me break that up in two sections. As a result of being justified by faith, we have peace with God. That's number one. So time to that now for me. Number one, we have peace with God. Number two, we have access. Let me stop there. Access means we have the ability to come in and come out. If somebody says, you know, like if you go to the Braves game, you got your ticket, you can go in and out. Why? Because you have a ticket. You have access. Nobody's going to stop you and say, well, your ticket. They're going to say, just come on in. You know, you, 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 got, you, you got access. We have access through our belief in God. And because we're justified by faith, we have access by faith. Now, the faith would be our ticket. As we have faith with God, as we have faith in God, we have access to him. But as we walk in faith in God, we're constantly able to experience this access constantly. As long as you have faith in God, and it's not like God pulls away from you, you just can't walk in there um, without having faith. I, I said this story a long time ago. But let me tell it again today because it happened again the other day. I went to this bank. I went to the doctor up in Buckhead. And I had to get uh, some cash. So I went, I Googled and said, where's the nearest Bank of America? And said, it says Bank of America video at Peachtree Road. So I didn't know what that meant, but I rode over there. It was about a quarter mile away. And when I got to the door, the door was locked. And I saw all of these teller machines and I saw these video machines, but I couldn't get in. And I kept pulling the door. And finally, I looked at the thing and said, put in any debit card to open. So I pulled out my debit card, stuck it in, and the door clicked. I had access to the bank. When we have faith in God, and that means anytime I go there, anytime I go there, I have access by doing what? Slipping in my debit card. And the funny thing is, you can slip in any debit card. I was at Bank of America. You can slip in SunTrust, Wells Fargo, whatever. But that would give you access. When we have faith in God daily in our lives, we constantly have access. That's our access, faith. Um, faith is our access to experience what comes next. Look what it says, this grace. We are able to experience the unmerited favor of God. And this is the key part I like, wherein we stand. We stand in grace. Why? Because through God's love and, and his grace, we have faith. And we already talked about that back in chapter four. 
we stand in grace. Like right now, wherever you are, you can, I don't know where you are. You could be Great Mon or Cobb or Gwinnett. Wherever you are, you if you save, you, because you're saved rather, you're standing in grace. You're just, grace is all around you. The unmerited favor of God surrounds you, okay? Now, understanding that, we experience that grace by faith. God is with us. His grace surrounds us. Everywhere we go, grace is there. The unmerited favor of God is moving with us. And why? As we walk with by faith in God, we experience the grace, his grace. I hear people say all the time, well, I was lucky. That was grace. Oh, I don't know how that happened. That was grace. I, I almost got my car told. I came out at the right time. Grace. That's But, but as we walk by faith, we experience the God, God's grace wherein we stand. Y'all got me? That makes any sense right now? I want us to understand that. We experience God's grace. We have access to it by faith. And we already stand in it, but we get it because of the faith we have in God. So it's faith gets us there, and faith allows us to experience the, the grace of God in our lives. Now, this next part says, in addition to that, this is number three, we are able, my brother, sister, in Christ, to rejoice. I can stop there, to rejoice, to rejoice, to just be full of joy that comes out. See, it's one thing to have joy on the inside, but rejoicing means that it makes you do something, that you're happy about it. You're you're dancing, you're waving your hands. Everybody, you just say hallelujah to your name, Lord. That's rejoicing, that, it, that somebody that's standing next to you can know that you rejoice in the Lord because it comes on the outside. That, that's what it means. It, it means that, that it's an active exhibition of the inner experience you're having. That's what rejoicing, Lord just gave me that. I, had, I don't even know what that said. Lord gave me that one from heaven. It's an active exhibition that you, and it don't have to be nothing, it doesn't have to be nothing fancy. Sometimes you just say, thank you, Lord. That's rejoicing. That, that's rejoicing in what's on it, from, from what's on the inside. We can rejoice. Look at this, in the hope, in hope. That word, again, that's expectation. We can rejoice in the expectation that, in fact, we will experience the glory of God. So all of us able today to rejoice in the hope, then in the, and, and this expectation is not, oh, I hope it comes. It means I know it's on the way. I know it's coming of the glory of God. What does that mean? That means that we're living daily with the knowledge that we will experience in, 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 in eternity the glory of God, the weight of God, the presence of God. Yeah, we got to, sometimes we got to deal with folk down here, but one day we're going to be in the presence of God. We're going to experience the glory of God. That's ours. So we can just, we can just think about that. Sometimes when you're going through, just say, you know what? The glory of God is, is waiting on me. I'm, I'm on my way. I'm on my way. I'm on my way to, to a better day in the presence of the Lord. Somebody said, that's a long way away. I don't know how long it is, but I'm looking forward to it. I don't know if it's tomorrow, uh, 10 years from now, whatever it is, I'm looking forward to it because it's ours. I can rejoice in it because it's ours because we've been justified by faith. I'm going to do one more verse, if y'all don't mind. Verse three says this. So that's three right there. Peace with God, access by faith to his grace where we stand, and we're able to rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. But Paul, almost like Paul said, wait a minute, that ain't it. Look at verse three. He said, not only so. So what he's saying is, that ain't it. Before you, before you get too happy, I got some more for your happiness. He said, but we also able to glory in tribulations also. Now, glory. We were rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. We're able to glory in tribulation. Paul, what are you trying to tell me? Paul says, I want you to understand that you're able to rejoice in the hope, in the ex anticipation and expectation that we experience the glory of God. But not only that, we also can glory in tribulation. We can look at tribulation. It's not something that's destroying us. But we can look at tribulations as something that is a pathway to experience the glory of God. How about that? That we can be excited. And, and, and it's not like we're glad trouble coming, but we know that trouble is a walkway. And so we're able to say, thank you, Lord, e even on the walkway of trouble, because we know it's ultimately a, an indicator of the fact that we are going into the presence. We're, we're walking toward the glory of God. See, the child of God has to look at things different. If you look at things like your friends that ain't saved, if you look at things like the world, then you need to kind of recalibrate because we cannot and should not look at the troubles of life as destructive forces. We should look at the troubles of life as those things that allow us to engage or participate. Paul, I mean, uh, Philippians chapter three, participate in the suffering of Jesus. So when we suffer, we're simply participating in the suffering that our, Jesus already did, which should, which should really strengthen us our belief that we have in fact the gl his glory in our future so when tribulation come instead of us quitting 
and giving up and giving out and being stressed and de-stressed. We should say, you know what, This I got to go through this because God's glory is waiting on me. That's what he says, that we should glory in tribulations. Tribulations are not enough for us to cry about. Tribulations are something for us to praise God about. I'm not saying you ain't going to cry in your tribulation. I have. But I'm saying we can rejoice and give God glory in those tribulations, knowing that it's lining us up with the eternal, being in his eternal presence forever and ever. I'm going to do this last part. Paul says, Paul, Paul let me tell you, ask you a question, man. Why, why do we glory in tribulations? Paul said, we know something. And I always believe the Christian got to know some stuff. What do we know? We know that tribulation works on us. It's doing some work on us. It ain't it ain't breaking us. It's building us. Tribulation trial is building us. As we believe in God and but walk with the Lord and walk by faith and not by sight, tribulation is working on us. Paul said, "Let me just give you one. I'm gonna give you one tonight." Paul gave you some more. But I'm gonna give you one tonight. It works with patience. Paul says, "When you are walking with the Lord." And you're going through tribulations, but you keep your eyes on the glory of God. When you are living in, in anticipation of the glory of God. And when tribulations come and you glory in those knowing those just things that tie you close together with Jesus and his sufferings. He said, what's going to happen is instead of you being all stressed out and tense and, and trying to get some, you're just going to relax. You're going to say, well, you know, God's going to work it out. How many of us are matured enough that we believe that God's going to work it out? How many believe that? That God's, God's got it. So that's patience. That means you ain't stressing it. That's you saying God got that. God has it. I ain't, I ain't going to worry about it because God got it. Why am I going to try to take it out of God's hand when he got it? That's what patience is. Patience saying, God, I'm trusting you and I'm not looking at my clock because I know your clock different than mine. I might have to wait a little while. I'm going to tell this last story and I'm going to go. I remember uh, somebody was asking me early on, you know, well, you know what you going to do? You know, you I'm waiting on the heart. What can you do? I said, what can I do? I said, all I can do is trust the Lord and wait on the Lord. So I, I'm just going to wait it and watch him. And I'm going to watch it and I'm going to wait. And at the due time, you know, some people say, would you have rather gotten the heart earlier? I used to say, yeah, but you know what I can't realize? I got it when God wanted me to have it. And it was right on time. It was right on time. And that's how God blesses us when? Right on time. Patience. Hmm. God works patience out of us. When you got patience in the child of God, you got something. Because that means you ain't going to be walking around tossing to and fro at night. You trusting that God's going to come. Can somebody say it with me? Right on time. I'm going to let y'all go tonight because it's Friday night. Somebody might want to watch the game. But I thank God for each of y'all tonight. I thank God for each of y'all tonight. And I, I just pray that these words, the words in Romans, would just give us an uh, extra oomph that we would just be able to rejoice in God in our lives. I love you and may God bless you. Let's pray. <clears throat> Father, in the name of Jesus, we come tonight praising. We praise you tonight, Lord. We thank you tonight, Lord. We honor you tonight, Lord, because you are a sovereign, magnificent God. You are our God, and your love for us was so strong that you gave us your only begotten son, Jesus, to die for our sins. And in doing so, God, all you ask in return was to believe in you. God, we believe you tonight. We believe in you tonight. And we thank you, Lord, for our accounts being full of your righteousness. And we thank you, Lord, that the peace that we have. We thank you, Lord, for the joy that we have. We thank you, Lord, for the access we have. And we thank you, Lord, for the anticipation we have. And, Lord, finally, we thank you just tonight for the fact that we know <clears throat> that you're working on us. And we know that patience is building in us. I pray, God, tonight you just let these words <clears throat> bless every household, every individual Christian, every family. God, let these words get in our, our hands and feet that we can serve you better. Let these words, Lord, get in our hearts that we may be strengthened in our inner man. God, let these words get in our ears that we can hear your words saying that you're declared right. So let us hear it, Lord, that we won't hear nothing that the enemy is saying and nothing in the world is saying. God, let your word get on our mind, in our mind, that we might have peace and surpass with all understanding and that the fiery darts are saying no quench. God, let your word get on our lips, tongues, vocal, lungs, and throat that we can declare your word to a dying world, to each other, to ourselves. God, give us boldness to declare your word everywhere we go. And we pray, God, again, that you build a head of protection around us, that the fire and darts the same will be quenched. God, give us joy. Give us peace. Give us the posture of praise every day, knowing this is your will for those of us in Christ Jesus. And finally, Lord, let us rejoice in you. Lord, it's in Jesus' name, his precious name, we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless y'all, St. Peter. Hold on, Zoom. Love you, Father. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you.